I dedicate this speech to Mr George Bender, who waged the most courageous 10-year battle to protect his family and property from multinational and government subterfuge. When his land was fleeced from underneath him by the country meant to protect him. George endured, but ultimately was destroyed fighting for the land he loved. Land passed down in his family for 108 years. Today, we remember George and all those who have suffered unjustly at the hands of a tyrannical, out of control government. A government that creates tragedy that I am compelled to stand against today and all the days ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, Australian citizens, friends, family and supporters alike, thank you for your patience, encouragement and staunch support over the last few chaotic weeks. Also, thank you for allowing me the time since my release last week from detainment to gather my thoughts, reorganise my objectives and make the concise and firm decisions that I am about to share with you now. But before I do, for the record, I would like to take the opportunity to formally and very publicly apologise to the Australian Prime Minister, Mr Scott Morrison, his wife, Jen Morrison, and their family friends. My team has inside information that suggested that my recent social media posts towards the Prime Minister were misinterpreted by some cross-sections of the government as physical threats of harm. For this, I do truly apologise. It has never been my intention in my public work to cause this level of concern that was expressed across some sections of the government. I am not a dangerous or violent man, but I can rise to a passion that I am learning, whilst it does inspire a great many, it also scares others. This fear and apprehension is completely counterproductive to my very peaceful objectives. Subsequently, moving forward, I'm going to be taking far more consideration in how I express myself publicly towards my political opponents. My threats, of course, over the last few weeks were only ever intended to be political and legal threats. In the context of making political and legal threats, whilst I apologise for the recent misunderstanding, in the true context of my work, I do not retract my intentions or political aims for a more just, independent and democratic Australia. An Australia which has the interests of her citizens at heart, not foreign aid, foreign interest and international alliances built on greed, lies, state secrecy and corruption. I will never apologise for standing against this tyranny. In this capacity, I hold you, Prime Minister Scott Morrison, incapable of doing your job for the Australian people under the rule of law. And I assure you, Mr Bill Shorten, you are no better. Now, as for last week, and in the interests of transparency, I would like to fill my supporters in on the events of the last month. During the course of the month, my activity in social media was picked up by several government agencies. These agencies only having the ability to see a cross-sectional version of events with little to no context, received the impression that, one, I had so-called delusions of grandeur. And two, I may be a physical danger to Prime Minister Scott Morrison or other connected public officials. On the face of the information, it appears that the Prime Minister's AFP security team had a hand in making a complaint to the Queensland Fixated Threat Assessment Centre, who corresponded with Queensland Police to enforce a mental health examination. Last Tuesday, I was apprehended inside the Brisbane AFP headquarters by Queensland Police and detained for 36 hours in Royal Brisbane before being transported to Nambour Hospital over a total 72-hour examination. 
I'm proud to say that not one single psychiatrist, including a few of the most senior practitioners in Queensland, can provide one single example of this allegation of delusions of grandeur that I cannot prove has a solid basis in reality. Fundamentally, it is obvious to everyone who comes in contact with me that I am not a danger to myself or society. And so my treatment authority was revoked by the most senior psychiatrist in the region last Friday. I will continue to liaise with these professionals to ensure that once and for all, that my family and I are never again put through such turmoil. I take from this tumultuous experience overall something exceptionally transformational. My life to some seems incredulous and the way I have engaged government as a private citizen has brought concern and fear to others, which again has never been my intention. Those who do know me know that my lived experience is a true, exceptional and a unique one. An experience that I seek to serve in my daily life by making our country Australia and our government a more just, fair, accountable and an equitable one. I think I speak for all Australians when I say that we are completely exhausted by the corruption, ineptitude, backhanders and selling our country out from underneath us to foreign interests like China, the US and making unscrupulous secret partnerships like Five Eyes which undermine national sovereignty and the independent democratic process. Needless to say, we the Australian people are not the enemy and the constant monitoring, surveillance and suspicion has only achieved the erosion of democracy and privacy in our once lucky country. Fundamentally, the last week has taught me that I have been engaging government at the incorrect level, begging for change from the same officials responsible for our country's destruction is like trying to win a game of cards at a loaded casino absolutely and fundamentally impossible. As a result, and after carefully listening to you, my supporters, I hereby and solemnly make my most important public announcement and declaration to date. I hereby announce the formation of a new Australian political party, a party which I am confident will grow over the years to challenge the gridlock, decrepit stalemate of our two-party system. This new party, one for all Australians, that speaks at the bedrock of our oaths, our loves, our sacrifice and the unity of we, the Australian people. This party I have named our Remembrance Party. Our Remembrance Party must become a third major party player with a very real prospect over the next 12 to 16 years to form a majority government and as a result, take our country back from the globalists the banking cartels, the multinational corporate interests which have plundered our golden soils and taxed our wealth for toil to the point of a draconian oppression. I am not alone in the belief that two solemn days a year and their minute silence are not nearly enough to pay tribute to the sacrifices made by our Anzacs and diggers. In those world wars, and the other relevant and more recent conflicts. One paragraph at the start of a speech is not enough to remember and embrace the spirit, culture and custom of our First Nation people and their ancestors in our halls of parliament, let alone integrate the complex belief system of our First Nation people into a functioning government that embodies traditional customs as much as it does colonial ceremony. That is to say, this new Remembrance Party will be the living enactment and service to the sacrifices of our war fallen. And our first people who fell by the malice and cold hearted callousness of Imperial England during what can only be described as a colonial genocide. However, it is 2019, many hundreds of years since, and the time of victimhood and blame games must be done. This will allow our nation to truly heal. 
There is no room in hatred to progress Australia for Australians, a country where we all share the same red blood of our common human ancestry on this great land that we now call Australia. The two-party political system has sought to keep us divided, black and white, gay and straight, left and right, liberal and conservative amongst us. A raging argument and political debate over what are essentially, and at their core, complementary values. Values which out of balance lead to opposite and extreme radical and political ideology, the type of behaviour we are seeing today in the mainstream media. As the acting leader for this new party, until we form a membership of at least 500, register our party with the Australian Electoral Commission, hold our inaugural meeting and cast our first leadership ballot, I state firmly that I am not interested in identity politics. All the banal arguments and resentments of lesser political minds. I do not care if you are black, white, gay, lesbian, trans, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist or Christian, or any other. Your skin colour, religion, gender or sexual preference have absolutely no business or bearing in Australian politics. Particularly, your sexual preference is a matter only for the privacy of your bedroom. Do not bring private issues to the pressing public and national crisis we face as a country. What gender you feel like on a Friday compared to a Sunday is really your business only and is not representative of the majority of Australians that represent an incredible diversity. But share that one thing in common. We are Australian and we want, no, we deserve the very best country that our government can provide us. Identity politics progresses us nowhere closer to meaningful economic, industrial or technological solutions. Collective solutions which are the true engine of democracy. Who we are as unique Australians is protected and sacred. That is all. All Australians of any background are embraced as equal in the remembrance of what it is we have fought and sacrificed for to have the country we have today. If this mantra rings true to your heart, then you are one of us. If you seek to push personal, sexual, religious and racial divisions that would only seek to separate us and not unify us as a country, then you are not one of us. There are other political parties for you. Our Remembrance Party will be the two wings, left and right, of the same dove of peace. Without both wings in perfect harmony, the dove is unable to fly, and we are left one-handed in the work that both hands could more easily do together. There is a deep political philosophy that explains the harmony of the left and right spheres of politics. However, due to time constraints, I will not be covering this philosophy today. However, this harmony will be expressed in our party policies that follow. Today, I am proud to announce the first three core objectives and policies that I propose to begin the party are this. Number one, defence aerospace innovation with a focus on domestic manufacturing. Annually, our military spends 42.5 billion Australian dollars a year protecting our way of life. Our military has a sacred function. The lives of our service people are irreplaceable and just as sacred. We must carefully re-examine Australian foreign policy so that we are no longer coerced into aggression and illegal warfare in places like Iraq and more recently Syria where our military has been forced to take the lives of not just the enemy, but tragically, many innocent men, women and children. Other human beings. This has created an unnecessary hatred with Islam and enraged it. And whilst as a country, we will never back down to extremist and terrorist demands, we must be careful never again to create the monster that we now seek to destroy. For instance, 
just where were those weapons of mass destruction? Australia continues to throw itself into wars with the United States that have absolutely zero strategic relationship to the defence of our national borders and are oftentimes personal objectives largely conjured by questionable officials utilising the power of a highly corruptible central intelligence agency. Under a government run by my party, never again will Australia be used as a pawn of US foreign policy. We Australians will be nobody's fool and nobody's puppet. During peacetime, our military and its budget can be engaged in a reinvigoration of our defence weapons capability. From the view of aerospace and space exploration objectives, so as not to squander precious taxpayer money every year on senseless wars. We can at once keep our armed services agile and battle ready, but more effectively stimulate technological and industry growth, which, with the advent of technologies like quantum computing, to solve complex war game scenarios, minimise casualties in conflict, and potentially neutralise conflict before it even begins. This is the true art of war. In terms of Australia's energy requirements, I propose low energy nuclear reactions, or LENR, as validated by the prestigious Stanford Research Institute, or SRI Labs. And the very early research and development into gravitational propulsion currently held in US unacknowledged special access programs, or USAPs, would have a knock-on effect throughout the entire Australian economy sparking an exponential explosion in positive growth across the spectrum of our society. Keeping our military active, battle ready, enthusiastic about their job, stimulated and economically productive is a key economic benefit in peacetime and in wartime. Such a policy would only strengthen our borders by reinvigorating our entire defence force, whose objective again is our security not a political tool for identity politics as it seems to have been used for PR more recently under both the LNP and Labor governments. Number two, an omnipotent stance on anti-corruption both within government and big business. Over the last few decades, Australian Royal Commissions have become about as effective as a toothless tiger. We have seen this with the recent Banking Royal Commission, trillions of dollars of fraud and zero arrests. The Royal Commission into Institutional and Child Sexual Abuse, and yet Senator Heffernan's police list of 28 high-ranking pedophiles, including a former Prime Minister, has never been adequately investigated or held for public scrutiny. Not to mention the 1985 Royal Commission into the activities of the Nugent Hand Group. Most of you are aware by now that I hold previously classified intelligence that at much risk and detriment to myself and my family, I have forced into the public domain. This intelligence speaks of espionage and foreign interference in Australian affairs, drug trafficking and illegal money laundering through black market banking syndicates Syndicates that I assure you still exist today. Our Remembrance Party will take a very special interest in purging this criminal activity from Australia's shores by bringing justice to one of the most important cold case organised crimes in Australia's history. For many years, the two major parties of both LNP and Labor have behaved absolutely ineptly and failed to direct our security and law enforcement bodies to act accordingly on some very straightforward black and white information. Under our government, elite white collar criminals will bear the full brunt of law enforcement, while petty offences, for example, of leaving your window rolled down at a service station while your car is unattended, which currently carry a $113 fine, we will encourage state government to roll back. Everyday Australians deserve to be protected by our law enforcement. Not used for stealth tax, rampant revenue raising while organised crime is relegated to the too hard basket. 
we will chase the billions, if not trillions of dollars in off-balance accounts hidden in RBS Global, the Federal Reserve Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the Bank of International Settlements. By taking our grievance to the United Nations Security Council and the International Criminal Courts. I believe this black market money is due to our country in compensation for being used by these criminal bankers and hidden international syndicates operating historically within Australia and for leading us into drug wars like Vietnam and Afghanistan for opium and heroin respectively. We will turn tragedy into triumph and enrich our nation's treasury putting this blood money to use in education, health care, technological innovation and eradicating our economic deficit. This will bring down all taxation and allow the government to once again create its own self-sustaining industries competitively with private enterprise where the government can self-finance responsibly and not just rely on your back pocket. In this, justice will finally be served for our diggers, men, women, sons and daughters of Australia who fell in tyrannical and senseless wars. We will give their sacrifice a meaning previously only dreamt of, creating a legacy more powerful than any war memorial or fleeting ceremony. Do not fear that such a vision can be achieved. The instrument of the Australian government is tremendously powerful. Used with wisdom and with your support, we can and will direct the momentum of this vision to fruition. Of this, be very certain. And our third policy, new trade corridors to Africa, opening the roads to DR Congo. Some of you may be aware that I caught a close presidential relationship and am the representative of the King of Suku in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC, a Central African country that has largely and historically been pillaged and plundered by the very same globalists and foreign interests which have fed the global corruption and crime syndicate that I've previously spoken of today. Despite the fact that the DRC is considered one of the most mineral rich countries in the world with an estimated 20 trillion US dollars worth of precious natural resources still in the ground, ironically it still remains one of the poorest countries on earth. And this has been done deliberately. Yet Australia, with its mining decline due to China's economic slowdown, holds massive transferable skill and mining expertise which pitched correctly with Australian companies taking priority in DRC could enable the DRC to not only provide major cheap resources for an explosion of new domestic manufacturing under our party's first policy, but also stabilise the DRC economy and give back wealth in the way of jobs, utilities and diversified reinvestment back into the Central African people and businesses whose governments would no longer have to rely on foreign aid. Australia and the DRC are historically neutral and hold no resentments to each other diplomatically or otherwise. This is very important. I am currently a long way down the line and have made excellent headway in negotiations at the highest level to make such a trading partnership a reality for our country. Whilst this relationship may seem unusual to some, I assure you it is economically intelligent and will provide ongoing trade security for the next century at least. With the advent of the electric battery industry and DRC's reserves of both lithium and cobalt needed in these batteries, it is said that the DRC is set to become, for the electric age, what Saudi Arabia has been to the oil age. When one looks at the current government deficit of over half a trillion Australian dollars created by the failed trade agreements under both Labor and LNP, Clearly their way hasn't worked. We need something new. I know this trade opportunity will work for us and will work for Africa. An alliance built on respect, 
hard work and the genuine atmosphere of change in the new Felix Tshisekedi presidency in DRC. I caught similar high-level access in Zimbabwe, South Africa and Uganda. DR Congo President Tshisekedi vows to lift his people out of poverty and under our government we will pledge to support him in that endeavour. Morrison, Shorten, you are hereby on notice. I know I speak for most all Australian people, the silent majority, when I say that the complete and chaotic dysfunction that yourselves and your parties have displayed over the last few decades have more than proven that you are not only incompetent to govern, but have showed a complete disdain and contempt for everyday Australians, overtaxed, overburdened and treated like criminals in our own country. Whilst we began our nation as convicts, it is only right that we must shed our colonial shackles by acknowledging our country's birthright of sovereign self-determination. Let us remember why our parents and grandparents died in their wars. At once let us embrace the very real culture of our first people by acknowledging the awakening of their beliefs, sacred lands, dream time and the gathering of strength in First Nation tribes by the story of Wirith Jin. To unite First Peoples who acted as custodians of our lands for tens of thousands of years. Individual privacy and self-governance is sacrosanct and must be protected, but not at the expense of community and civic duty. Community and civic duty are the pillars of democracy, but not at the expense of individual privacy and self-governance. These two wings, the right and the left, are a fragile balance of seeming opposites. But I assure you, when embraced for the complementary wings of the dove of peace that they are, our country will unite speaking with a unified voice to the world that the great down under will be the example for our international community to follow. Scarcity and struggle is folly. In the not too distant future, the cup of plenty of nature's gifts of beauty, rich and rare, are the true inheritance of our children and our grandchildren. As we finally advance Australia's fair, as was promised and enshrined into the Constitution at Federation. This is the way we must remember them. Ladies and gentlemen, to commence, we require 500 members to register our Remembrance Party with the Australian Electoral Commission. Details will follow. Until last week, I've never in my life had the ambition to enter into politics. As most of you know, I'm pretty rough around the edges and Canberra isn't really my cup of tea. However, I have been forced into this role by a government that refuses to abide by the Australian rule of law. And if government isn't going to do its job, ladies and gentlemen, we must become the government. Claiming the government by democratic process is the only way we will ever make change. Please join me. Join us to fight and win for our country in a way that will make our ancestors and our elders proud. I promise, should you support our party, we will legally, peacefully and democratically take our country back the way it was written to be and you will help make it so. Thank you.